Chapter 19. After returning to camp from his swim, Cole smeared lotion on his sore and blistered hands. A movement caught his eye as he pulled on the leather gloves to start work. Hey, look, he called, pointing across the bay. Is that a coyote? Edwin and Garvey looked up, the, looked up at a ghost-like figure moving along the far shoreline. It's a wolf, Edwin said, a big one. The solitary gray animal loped along the shore, stopping every dozen strides to look around and sniff among the rocks. When it reached the stream, it lowered its head to drink, then bounded across the shallow rapids and disappeared into the thick underbrush. Tonight, we dance the wolf dance, Garvey announced. Already, Cole had begun framing the roof. He worked hard and deliberately without speaking. He wasn't mad. He just didn't feel like speaking to anyone today. Edwin and Garvey sat watching, occasionally offering bits of advice. By mid-afternoon, Cole had finished covering the roof rafters with plywood and began nailing plywood to the wall panels. Every cut had to be made with a handsaw. The rain made the wood slippery and the ground muddy. In the late afternoon, Cole rolled black tar paper over the roof and tacked it down. Now the cabin was ready for galvanized roofing sheets. As he struggled to lift the awkward sheets onto the roof, wind caught at them. One sheet bent in half. Edwin and Garvey refused to help, even though Cole cast a few hard glances their way. Finally, darkness fell across the bay and Cole quit work. Next year, every trace of your existence here will be removed from the island, Edwin said. Taking this structure back down will be your last chore before leaving. I'll just burn it, Cole grumped as he headed toward the tent. I've had practice with that. Where are you going, asked Garvey. I'm hitting the sack. Not so fast, champ. We're hungry and you still haven't danced the wolf dance. I'm dog tired and I'm not your slave. There's cold cereal over there if you want some. Cole crawled into the green canvas tent. Have a good sleep, called Garvey. Tomorrow we tear down the shelter and head back to Minneapolis. Cole poked his head back out of the tent flap. What are you talking about? You're finished here, said Garvey, his voice hard and absolute. There's not enough room on this island for both you and your attitude. Cole's thoughts raced. Garvey must be bluffing. But what if he wasn't? Nothing was worth that gamble. Cole stumbled from the tent. Okay, okay, I'll fix you some supper. It's not about supper, said Garvey. It's about the chip on your shoulder. You still think life is a free ride. You're still blaming the world for everything and looking for the easiest way to get by. It's only been two days, and already you've got your attitude back. I'm sorry, Cole stammered. I didn't mean it. Don't apologize to us, Garvey said. Apologize to yourself. It's your life you're betraying, not ours. Cole crossed from the tent to the fire and fed wood quickly onto the flames. Not a word was spoken as he prepared instant chicken casserole mix for Edwin and Garvey. He made extra effort to serve the food up nicely, but inside, he didn't feel much like celebrating. He felt frustrated and desperate. Edwin and Garvey ate in silence. I said I was sorry, Cole said. You also said you had changed, answered Edwin. Please don't take me back, Cole's voice wavered. I promise I'll try harder. I'll do anything you ask. Edwin stirred, stood and faced Cole across the fire. It's time to cut losses and send you home. I didn't mean what I said. I just... Edwin held up his hand. Stop your mindless talking. Your words insult me. They're just noise in the air. They don't mean anything. Tomorrow morning, I want you to get up alone and soak. Then I want you to carry your ancestors and roll your anger away. When you return to camp, we'll see what you've learned. Edwin turned and headed for the tent. Garvey followed. Hey, aren't we going to dance the wolf dance? Cole asked as he strung the coolers up in the tree away from the bears. We're going to bed, said Garvey. You're the one who spotted the wolf. Do whatever you want. That's your usual program. Cole watched as the men entered the tent, leaving him alone. The rain had let up, but a lonely breeze flapped the tent awning and chilled the night air. Cole was bone-weary as he walked to the water to clean dishes. The tide was letting out, and he tripped, skinning his shin on the rocks. Limping back to camp, he stood beside the fire, nursing his bruised leg. He felt as alone and frustrated as when he had been left mauled on the rocks. Edwin and Garvey didn't understand. They didn't know what it was like to be this alone, this afraid. As Cole stared into the flames, he thought about the wolf. The wolf was alone, too, without anybody to care for it. Cole shook his head. That wasn't exactly true. Wolves often hunted in a pack. Together, they accomplished more than they could alone. As Cole stared into the flames, he found himself crouching like a wolf. Slowly, he inched forward around the flames. His head hung low as if prowling. Gradually, he circled faster, pretending to run with the pack in pursuit of a wounded moose. He felt the power of the pack working together. The pack was powerful when they depended on each other. Any wolf that left the pack lost the protection of the other wolves and became weaker, no longer sharing the pack's food. Almost reluctantly, Cole finished his dance. Trying not to wake the others, he entered the tent and prepared for bed. As he squirmed into his sleeping bag, a voice surprised him. What did you learn, Garvey asked? That you need the help of others like a wolf pack. Good night, whispered Garvey. Good night, said Cole. 
Edwin coughed. Have a good soak tomorrow. Cole woke often during the night, afraid he might oversleep. He kept lifting the tent flap and peering out. When it seemed the night would last forever, the blackness finally softened into a dull gray. Cole could see the point of rocks at the opening of the bay. He dragged himself out of his bag. It was time to go to the pond. The rain had let up, so he rolled his clothes into a bundle and crawled outside the tent to dress. Even without the rain, the air had a brisk edge to it. Cole couldn't believe he was getting up this early to go sit in a freezing river. Maybe a jail cell wouldn't be so bad. As he headed out from camp, he wondered if Edwin and Garvey had been serious about returning him to Minneapolis. He kicked a small rock into the water. Cole reached the stream and splashed along the bank toward the pond. Under his arm, he carried a towel. He was so lost in his thoughts, a low-hanging branch smacked him hard in the forehead. He bent over, grimacing, momentarily dazed. Then he continued. When he reached the pond, Cole hesitated. It would, not be, easy, it would be easy not to soak or carry the rock. All he needed to do was to make up a good story before returning to camp. Something told Cole that Edwin and Garvey couldn't be lied to this morning. Immediately, he stripped and waded into the icy water. The pool didn't seem quite so cold as, as the first morning they had come, but still it took his breath away as he crouched and lowered himself in. He held his breath and breaststroked over to the rocky bench. Hugging his arms tightly to his chest, he sat shivering and looked around at the water, the trees, and the dawn sky. His whole body was peppered with goosebumps. He wondered how long he could stay in the pool. Edwin had sat calmly as if, try as if sitting in a warm bathtub. Cole tried closing his eyes. Maybe it would help to concentrate on something else. He drew air slowly past his lips and let it escape the way he had seen Edwin breathe. Over and over he breathed, trying to clear his mind. Gradually, he quit hugging his chest and let his arms drift out and away from his body until they hung suspended in the water. Cole found that if he sat completely still, his numb skin actually felt warm. He breathed deliberately, imagining himself as calm as the pond. Slowly, his eyes opened, and he looked at the sky reflecting in the water. The floating clouds glowed red with the coming sunrise. A flicker of movement in the reflection made Cole glance up, but then he realized the movement was a fish hovering near his knees. Holding his breath, Cole watched the silver fish. He wondered how the trout would taste for breakfast. At the same instant he thought of eating the fish, it moved off and disappeared. Cole released his breath. Had he moved? Was, he, was that what scared the fish? Or had his thoughts exposed his presence? Surely the fish couldn't sense his thoughts. When Cole breathed again, he noticed that his breaths had cooled, as if he were sucking on a menthol cough drop. He also noticed that in the water his joints didn't ache, nor did he feel pain from his blistered hands. His few thoughts seemed distance, distant from his body. The cold water somehow suspended his whole existence. When Cole finally left the pond, it was not because he had gotten too cold or impatient, but because he had finished his soak. He drifted forward in the water until he could breaststroke gently, barely rippling the calm surface. On shore, Cole toweled dry. He felt he had discovered something, but wasn't sure what. All he had done was sit in cold water and try not to think, and yet that simple act had made him feel so calm. After dressing, Cole walked to where Edwin's ancestor rock had stopped when it rolled down the slope the day before. He moved stiffly from being so cold, but his joints didn't ache as they had when he crawled from the tent early that morning. He paused before lifting the rock and slowly stretched his body, touching his toes, reaching for the sky, twisting at the waist, and leaning backward. All the while, he kept breathing deeply. The deep breaths seemed to slow down his thoughts and make him calm. Cole wondered how Edwin had discovered this. Cole kept stretching. Then he lifted the rock and started up the hill. He neither rushed nor dawdled. He moved deliberately, trying not to look ahead at how far he had left to go. Instead, he tried to imagine each step as a day in his life. Whenever he stumbled, he imagined a day in his life when he had stumbled. There had been plenty of those days. But when he stopped to catch his breath, he looked back and saw how far he had come. He had come a long way since smashing Peter's head on the sidewalk. That seemed like another lifetime now. Cole wondered if the consequences of that moment would ever disappear. Cole grimaced as he looked at the rock in his arms. He didn't want to spend his life in a jail cell. He hugged the rock tightly to his chest. What a fool he had been. Things could be different. At the top of the hill, Cole lowered the rock gently to the ground and stood without pushing it. He couldn't stop wondering why he had been born and thinking about all the twisted events that had brought him to this moment. It seemed a bizarre dream to be standing alone on this rocky hillside in Alaska with a round stone at his feet, his mind filled with thoughts so totally different from anything he'd known running around on the streets back in Minneapolis. He felt like a new and different person. Slowly, Cole let go of his ancestors and allowed the stone to become his anger. He knew that he had to quit blaming others, including his father, for his problems. As long as blame still existed, so would his anger. He had to let go, the same way he let go of this rock. With that thought, Cole sank to his knees and placed both hands against the rock. 
With a grunt, he shoved it down the slope. As the rock tumbled faster and faster, Cole felt his body growing lighter, and when the rock smashed to a stop at the bottom, he felt as if he could fly. Now it was time to go back to camp and talk to Garvey and Edwin. Cole started down, looking ahead toward the pond. A movement caught his attention, and he spotted a large white shape disappearing into the tall trees below.